to our Christian Fellowship softball girls team state champs. Any of these other schools, I just want to say this. You don't want any of this. Now, we're really proud of our girls winning the KCAC state championship yesterday. Praise God. Scott about got me in deep trouble there with my wife. We had a wonderful day yesterday together. It's good. God is so faithful. Thank the Lord. Well, happy Mother's Day, Mama, and everybody else as well. Privilege to get to have my Mama with us here today, always a blessing. I know that a lot of mothers out there think that your children are angels and can do no wrong. That was like a nervous laugh. Outside of my mother, I want to tell you, that's not true. Your kids aren't perfect. Well, obviously, exempt mother is your own offspring. Well, one of your offspring. Oh, just kidding. She's at work. I wouldn't have dare said that if she was in the building. I'm scared of her. They have their flaws, plenty of them. You know, it's tough to see as a parent the flaws of your children. But they're there, and they present themselves at an early age. But let me tell you something. There was a woman whose name was Mary, and she had a child that was perfect. When the mothers got together, and they said, oh, you got to see my baby. He's just perfect. Or look at my child. He's just perfect. Mary could actually mean that. Jesus was spotless. He was the spotless, perfect Lamb of God from birth. Jesus did not have to grow into righteousness. Jesus was perfect his entire life. It was true. He was perfect in every way. Can you imagine this for a moment? Think about Jesus from the perspective of Mary, never having a child that came in the kitchen with chocolate chips all over their mouth, and you asked them, did you eat the cookies? Well, it wasn't me. Jesus never lied to his mother. Now, mothers, I know this is far-fetched, and this is hard to actually imagine, but imagine telling your child to do something and they were obedient the first time, every single time that you told them to do it. Somebody's starting to get happy over there. That's how Mary had it, was it not? If Jesus was disobedient to his mother, then that meant that he had a sin in his life, and we know that he was perfect. He was obedient every time. Uh, we, have to, we try to teach first-time obedience to Trey. It's been a process. Sometimes it takes the Board of Education. It works. <laughs> He's, we got a good boy. Can you imagine never hearing your child back talk you with a nasty attitude? Is that even fathomable to you? Yeah, the belt of truth is also a good one to apply. That's how Mary's life was. She had a child that was perfect. You know, I've been studying this week on her life. And we know very little about her in scriptures, but if we search a little deeper, I think we can find out that there are lessons to be learned from this woman of God. This morning, I want to talk about a manger, a jar, a cross, and a disciple. You know, you can say those things together, and you think, what, what does that have to do with each other? A manger, say a manger, a jar, a cross, and a disciple. First point I want to talk about this morning is the manger. 
Mary. And I speak on this traditionally at Christmas because this is the nativity narrative. But I want you to think about this briefly. I'm not going to labor this point very much. Was a young Jewish girl, a young Jewish virgin girl, that received an incredible visitation from an angel. One that had never been encountered since the face of the planet, and no one else has ever since received this visitation that Mary received. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph, about to get married, and she gets this word from this angel. Blessed art thou among women, you found favor in the sight of God and man. And he gives her this word, behold, you shall conceive a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. For he shall sit on the throne of his father, David. This is a young girl, young teenage girl, young virgin teenage girl that received a word from the Lord and she knew how to hear the voice of God. Let me tell you something. It's not enough in life to only know how to hear the voice of God. Trust me, as children of God, we need to learn how to hear the voice of God. But if you just hear the voice of God and don't adjust your life to what the Word of God actually says, then what you've just done is made yourself disobedient and accountable to something. Mary heard a word from the Lord. Now, put yourself in her shoes for a moment. I know that's a little bit more difficult for you men. But do that for a moment. You've received this word. You're going to conceive a son. Think about all of the things that a mind would wonder to. Because she was just like you and I. I don't believe Mary was deity. I know she wasn't. Mary was a human being like you and I. She had her own things in her life. She had her own plans for her life. And she did, I guarantee you, what you and I would do. Because I've received words from the Lord before, and the first thing I always do is my mind always goes to the end run of what is this going to mean. Well, if I do this, then this will happen. And we always try to play out the end when we hear a word from the Lord. Let me tell you something. God's not called you to do that. When you hear a word from the Lord, you might not ever know what that end's going to be, but if he shows you a stepping stone to step on, you better step on it and trust him in faith that it's going to be okay. Mary's mind had to wonder too, well, what if? What if this is true and I have a child? Well, my marriage is over to Joseph. He'll never marry me once he finds out I'm pregnant. Once he finds out I'm with child, I'm out of the picture. Truthfully, he'll probably have me stoned in front of everybody. Her mind went to where your mind would go. But she made a life-changing decision, and because of this decision, we've heard about her today. And it's a decision that every one of us need to make every single day of our life. Be it unto me according to your will. She made one decision. She got past the mental arguments that she was experiencing. And I know you're listening today. Uh, listen quickly and we will, I promise you, we'll beat the Baptist and the Methodist to all the rest of us so you don't have to wait. But God has something for you today. Be it unto me according to your will. And I want you to look at the story that transpired. Once she made that yes decision for God, that's always available to you and I. Even if we don't understand the end run, where this is going to end up, if we get to that place of, I say yes. I say yes, I don't get it. I don't understand it, and I probably never will. But I say yes. What a lesson to learn from a woman of God. She look at the process. Immediately, the Holy Spirit came upon this woman. And she started a worship service that I would have loved to hear from the next room. Oh, my soul glorifies the Lord. And she started praising the name of the Lord. 
and she came to Joseph. And you know what? Sure enough, her worst fears came true in Joseph's mind. I'm going to put her away quietly. I'm not going to have her killed, even though that's my legal right. I'm going to put her away quietly. And God spoke to him. And he restored and said, hey, this is okay. This is of me. They got together. Hurdle one was over because she said, yes, God took care of the rest. Let me tell you, we look to take care of the rest when all God is saying, just say yes, that's my job. I'll take care of these things for you if you'll just trust me and say yes, this is in my hands. It's not your job to make every little detail work out perfectly. All I'm asking you to do is say yes. She goes to her cousin's house. Her baby leaps for joy. Everything's going great. The child comes forth. We get magi coming from the east that bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Shepherds coming, praising God, glory to God in the highest. They're praising and bowing down at the feet of Jesus. All because Mary said yes. I want to land on this for a moment. Because this verse is awesome. After everything happened, that whole nativity narrative ends with one phrase. And Mary treasured these things in her heart. Let me tell you something. There is a treasure box awaiting you. And it's awaiting your obedience in the Lord. If you will step out and say that yes to God, even though you don't understand where it will lead you, there is a treasure box that is waiting for you, waiting for you to step out and say, yes, I will accept that. Yes, I will receive. Yes, I will go. Yes, I will do. There will be a time you look back and your life will be nothing more than just a memory after memory after memory of the goodness of God because you said yes. I'll talk about my mama for a minute. Talk about my mama, it's going to be good. Don't you talk about my mama. When I was 10 years old, we got a word from the Lord and a calling from the Lord on our family. I didn't understand this at the time. We were settled, and I had what I would consider the perfect setup as a child. We lived across the driveway from my grandparents. I learned so much in those times of how to properly eat biscuits and gravy. How to save the last biscuit and spread it with molasses and butter mixed together. Oh my Lord. Woo. Yes. These were valuable life lessons. When mom and dad would not let us, it was a simple journey across the driveway. And we were automatically enabled to do what we desired to do. What a perfect setup. Can you imagine that setup? Every morning, homemade breakfast, country ham, sausage, bacon. I was the taste quality inspector every day, going over there grabbing bacon. They had a refrigerator stocked full of Dr. Pepper that I would help myself to without any type of punishment. If I got too hyper, they would send me back across the driveway. <laughs> Let me tell you something about this, young parents. We have now repped, reaped, repped what we sowed. Yes, it's not over yet. <laughs> get out. Uh, my son, Friday night, spent the night with my wife's parents, spent the la night last night with my parents. We've not hardly seen him this weekend. I'm terrified of what we're about to experience. <laughs> Ab absolutely terrified. And I've totally t traced the rabbit trail, but we had the perfect setup as a kid until the Lord spoke. I never will forget those times. We, we did something that I think every family should do. We walked through situations together as a family. 
You know, a lot of times we feel like we need to shield our kids from things. I believe if we would involve them in more things, they would see the goodness of the Lord at the early age. We found out that God had called our family, my dad, into the pastorate. It might as well have been in Timbuktu. Perryton, Texas. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. Panhandle of Texas. That was a long way from my grandparents. That was a long way from my lot. That was a long way from everything that I held dear. And I remember my mother on that trip to Texas. My dad had received that call, and she had a very similar type experience of, I don't really want to do this, but Lord, I say yes. And I remember the tears falling down my mother's face in a Plymouth Reliant K on the way out to Texas. How we all fit in there with our junk is an amazing story in itself. The Plymouth Reliant K. I remember her crying all the way out there. But I remember the yes that she said. Rick, I don't want to do this. I don't want to leave my, my mama. I don't want to leave my daddy. I don't want to leave this. But this is God. And I say yes. Because of that yes, let me tell you the treasure box that I am today. As a child, because of that yes, I saw the provision of the Lord that that was inexplicable. It couldn't be anything else other than God supernaturally provided. I saw the supernatural, miracle-working power of the Lord in our church. The first Sunday we were there, a woman died in the service, and her eyes rolled back in her head, and God raised her right there in front of everybody. Dad was the only one in the building that knew what had happened. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Because they said yes. Let me tell you, you don't get treasures in the Lord by saying no. You don't get treasures in the Lord by waiting and postponing. You jump and obey when God says yes. And when you do, you'll look back at the treasure house that He has built for you. And you'll be thankful that that yes came. I believe that's what it meant when it said Mary treasured these things up in her heart. Because she remembered the doubts that she had when that word came. She remembered the fears that she experienced when the angel came to her. But she also remembered that trembling little girl that said, Yes, I choose you, Lord. I'll do it. And she had a treasure box full of stuff because of that decision. The manger. That's the first lesson we had to learn from Mary. The second one, turn your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 2. This is another great lesson to learn. The jar. On the third day, verse 1 of chapter 2 of John. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Mike McCollum and I was talking before church about this. And he said the only reason Jesus was at a wedding was that his mother made him go. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. <laughs> Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out. Now, let's stop for a moment. How significant of a problem is this really? You got a bunch of people that had drunk all the wine in the house and they're thirsty. I don't know. In the grand scheme of things, probably not that big of a deal. But it meant something to Mary. It meant something to Mary. I mean, it's not like someone was laying on their deathbed. And they needed Jesus immediately, like it was when Lazarus was in John chapter 11. We need you now. It was, they had ran out of wine because they had drank so much. But Mary goes to Jesus. Is Jesus the host of this wedding? No. He's simply in attendance. 
Is there any indication that Jesus had some sort of distillery where he could produce a bunch of wine? Was that what he did before? No, he was a carpenter. Why did she go to Jesus? Because it mattered to her. She goes to Jesus and says, Woman, Jesus, do not approach your mother as woman. But he, didn't, he meant no disrespect because he was perfect. But I can tell you, if I approach my mother like that, it would be interpreted in a different way. I'm just kidding. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In anywhere in that passage... Did Jesus lay out the blueprint for how to get more wine? Did he talk about fermentation? Here's what you need to do. Go get you some grapes. <laughs> Smash them. No. All he said was, it's not my time. What does this have to do with me? But Mary's response is remarkable, especially in light of the response that she just got from Jesus. She says, the mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Jesus had not performed a public miracle at this point. This is the first. The first miracle. It's not happened yet. But Mary had faith in Christ for the little things. And she knew that with Jesus, everything was possible. I'm telling you, church, that is a powerful point. Because a lot of times in life, we find ourselves going to God when we need something major. Like God is some sort of insurance policy that we carry in the fire safe at our house when things get bad. God loves you so much. He is genuinely concerned about the things that everyone else in life would say, that's insignificant, that doesn't matter. To Jesus, it does. Mary taught us that we can go to Jesus with the things that seem insignificant. And she also taught us in this story to be able to believe for things that had never been done before. And listen to the story. Do whatever he tells you. Bring me these jars full of water. Jesus, we don't want water. We want wine. We don't really like the water here. Just do what he says. They go get the water, pour it out, start drinking. And apparently there was this custom, I get this, when people started drinking, they would give them the best stuff first, and then after they didn't care, came along the lesser quality wine. And this guy says, hey, you've saved the best stuff for last. This is the best wine I've ever had. Where did that start? It started with Mary, the mother of Jesus, who wasn't even hosting the banquet, but she saw that Jesus was able. Take that with you today. That the things that you think, well, nobody's going to care about this. This really doesn't matter. Jesus does. Jesus knows where you're at this morning. He knows your heart's cry this morning. It might be something insignificant even to you, but Jesus cares. He knows exactly where you're at, and he cares. Mary taught us about the jar. Everyone say, the jar. This one is always tough. The third thing she taught us about was the cross. Let me tell you something. There was a small, extremely, extremely small crowd of people, of supporters at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Everyone else were, they were there to ridicule spite, to scorn him. Every disciple that Jesus had, bar one, left him. 
high and dry when things got tough. But not Mary. She had a different view at the cross than anyone else that was there. You had some excited in victory that they had defeated this overthrow. You had the jealous religious crowd that was also happy. You had the disciples who were scared so they ran. But you had a mother sitting at the foot of the cross watching her son struggle for every breath that he took, watching blood run down his face and body. She had a different view than anybody else. And if there's any point that I see in this whole sermon today that encapsulates motherhood, it's that. It's that. When everybody else forsakes you, when everybody else gives up on you, when everybody else has abandoned you, there's your mom. It wasn't always easy. There was a time she wanted to talk to Jesus and the ministry was pushing in on him and people came in and Jesus was busy. He said, hey, your mother and brothers are here. And he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers but those that do the will of the Father? And she didn't get the audience that she desired. Well, that didn't offend her. Would it offend you? I can tell you this. This woman would be offended right here. If she came in and said, Richie, I need to talk to you. Hey, Richie, your mom's outside. Who is my mother? No, 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 no. I can tell you this, I mentioned the Board of Education, I'm still not too big for it. But there she was, faithful, loving, supportive, there at the end. I think the greatest life lesson that Mary taught us is how to be faithful. She never forsook him. Yeah, she stepped out in faith and believed on the word of the Lord, yes. She believed in the miraculous power of the Lord for she had even seen it with the jar. But what she taught us from the cross is one of the most remarkable things that I think I could ever imagine. She did not abandon him even to the end. I'm telling you guys, imagine that. Imagine kneeling, weeping. This isn't a rabbi she's following. It's not a teacher that she's following. She is there because it's her son. She raised him. And there he is, struggling for breath on a cross, giving his life for the salvation of all of humanity. And there she is. We're here to talk about Jesus today, but let's, let's honor some moms here today. How many people can testify to that? When I was at my lowest and at the end, she was there. How many people can say that? That when everybody else had given up on me, she was there. When I was at my lowest point ever, I'm here today on the other side because of that woman. Thank God for godly women that know how to stand beside. The last thing I want to mention is the disciples. Everyone say the manger, manger. the jar, jar. the cross. cross. And now, what do you mean the disciples? After Jesus resurrected, Mary was listed along with the disciples at the resurrection. Mary became a follower of Jesus. She had to make a transition, see? She had to make a transition from Jesus being something else to Him being her personal Savior. 
I'm not following you now because you're my son. You were my son. I'm not following now because you get you came up in my house. Now I'm choosing to follow you because you're the savior of all the world and I need you personally. That is a big jump to make, but she made it when Jesus was resurrected. She was one of the disciples listed in the number that he personally came to visit that was awaiting his appearing. Not one thing had happened like she thought it would. But now she's a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's a powerful thing, Dad. That somebody that raised this boy, she turned from a mother of Jesus into a follower of Jesus. Praise God for that. Now that's what I want to talk about the rest of the time here this morning. That's the greatest lesson we could learn today. I don't know where you are when you came in this place. But if there's one thing we can learn from the mother of Christ. And emulate. Is be a true disciple of Jesus. See, Jesus may be something else to you this morning. He may be a teacher. He may be a rabbi. He may be a prophet. But you have to make that same jump that Mary made. You have to decide once and for all if Jesus is who he says he is. See, she walked through the whole thing from you shall call his name Jesus. You shall call his name Emmanuel. She saw him raised up. She saw his supernatural power. She was there at the end. But she, even her, had to make the decision at the end. If this is all true, then Jesus is the Savior of all the world. And if that's so, I need him and I'm lost without him. That's the dilemma you find yourself in this morning. If Jesus is who he says he is. Then it's time to get things right. And if he isn't, then we are among all men to be pitied. If Jesus is not who he says he is. then what are we doing? Let me tell you, He is. He's not just the Son of God. He's the Savior of all the world, and you need Him. It's time to stop that battle, that tug of war, if Jesus is who He says He is. That's the decision you've got to decide today. Who is He? Mary taught you firsthand. She didn't even have any special treatment because she was his mother. She had to believe on the resurrected Lord and she was there at the end. Let me tell you something. You don't get any special treatment either. As a little kid, when we first went to Texas, I thought because my dad was the pastor, I was in good standing. I'd hop on the back of his U-Haul going to heaven. I'd slide right in. Pete Rowe style. No. It's a personal decision that you will make. To ignore it is to make it. To delay it is to make that decision. The mother of Christ had to make that decision and so will you. And what a greater time. There is no greater time than this morning to honor those that have stood beside you to say, I'll I'll make that decision. He's the Lord, and I need him. I'll become his disciple today. I need Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the lessons that we